If you grow up in France and you go to middle school, you encounter this character studying the history of, uh, of France. Bernard Palissy, 1501-1590, spent 16 years, 16 years, um, trying to duplicate a pottery that he'd seen. It wasn't clear if it was a China pottery or if it was a northern Italy pottery, but he was so taken by this idea that um, he decided that he was going to recreate that and become a potter. Um, 16 years. And the key of pottery at that time, this is advanced technology, this is advanced glass technology, is about the temperature of the kiln that you use. Um, so it's how do you get a high temperature kiln? He, uh, he ended up burning pretty much everything that he had, uh, not just the wood, but the furnitures and the, the, the wood planks in the parquet of his house. His family actually went hungry, his children and his wife went hungry. And, and, and that story really kind of captured my imagination as to, um, you know, what would someone like him uh, put his family at risk for this idea, for this, uh, this absolute deep belief that he wanted to recreate this type of thing. So this is what he ended up doing. After 15 or 16 years or so, he created a new type of pottery. It's called rustic ware. You know, by now it's pretty famous in the sense that it's 500 years old. But uh, it caught mostly the imagination of some uh, rich nobles that then started to fund him. So, so the question is really not so much about persistence, but it's when do you give up? So as an entrepreneur, as a, as a company founder, as a CEO, uh, you're constantly facing the question of what is the next step, especially if you're thinking about funding the company. Um, and, and in raising money and in continuing the process of, uh, of uh, uh, keeping your company alive, when do you give up? Um, persistence is equated to beliefs. You have to have very strong beliefs with respect to um, the purpose for which you're raising money. Or for in the case of Bernard Palissy, why was he trying to get, recreate these potteries? And beliefs in many ways, uh, if we talk about technology, which most of us in this room are about, beliefs have to do with solving a very, very hard problem. And solving a problem that is also a valuable problem. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be doing this. Hard problem, valuable problem. But how do you know? You probably know how it's hard. I mean, it's, it's easy to find out how a hard problem is hard, but how do you know it's valuable? And <clears throat> this is where reality check comes in. And reality check has to do either by convincing other people that this vision, this belief is important and valuable and therefore they'll fund you, or custom attraction. And this is where uh, flexibility comes in. Because in testing those beliefs, seeing and accepting the reality as it is, is part of how you pivot and how you modify your, uh, let's say, fundraising effort in order to achieve that. So if you look at uh, Bernard Palissy for 15, 16 years trying many, many different things. At the time, this was technology innovation. I'm going to show you technology innovation in a couple of years. So I can do this right here. Oops. Is it going to start? <coughs> So Kativa is about technology, but it's all, Kativa is also about display technology. And, and this is an example of what, in a couple of years from now, display will start looking like. So this company was formed eight years ago. Uh, this is a typical Silicon Valley story where the company formed out of MIT, moved to Silicon Valley right from the start, got a typical venture capital funding. And then approximately five years ago, when, when the world for funding hardware equipment company kind of starting to really go soft, um, we were in a position of, well, we cannot find funding, so maybe we can turn to a customer, and maybe we can actually find a way to fund the company via customers. So there is a saying in technology, and you probably have encountered this, which is, they love it or they buy it. How many times have you heard, gee, we love your technology, but when it comes to write a check, people say, well, all kind of reasons, why not? So we went to our most important customer, or at least soon-to-be customer at a time, uh, Samsung Display because our tool actually goes into uh, the Samsung display factories. And this is kind of an outline of what the factory looks like. And um, this factory 
actually was on paper. And the reason it was on paper is because a, a very one specific tool was missing. And that tool was sitting right here in the middle. And as a result of that, you couldn't have any output. So our pitch to Samsung was, you know, try our tool, validate the technology, and let's see if it works. Our hope was it would actually generate um, an investment from Samsung, and indeed it did. So we were able, we shipped our first system to Samsung in January 2014. For the first six months, uh, it was a very intense effort to get that tool to work. But in uh, summer, June 2014, um, Samsung not only bought a system to, put, to, uh, to create a factory here with our tool inside, output of displays, and at the same time, they funded us. They funded us not for the entirety of you know, the rest of the company's life, but they funded us for at least a, a significant amount of time. <clears throat> this was the first product out of Samsung factories using our technology. This is the Galaxy Edge S6, and it came out in volume production in 2015. What was interesting about this is as the company moved from MIT over to San Francisco and raised money from US venture capital, our next step for us was to actually go directly to Korea, and that's what I just showed, is that with Samsung validating our technology, we were able to raise capital, but more importantly, get a product into the market and get our technology in a product such as the S6, which then got us a lot of notoriety in China. So then we moved again from Korea to China, and in 2016, uh, we were able to raise capital from a combination of customers in China, but also funds in China, that were kind of convinced that our technology was actually valuable because by now, uh, you know, these are the products that came out in 2016. So this is the S7, the Google Pixel. This one actually also was a product our displays was in, but we had nothing to do with uh, the fact that this product really kind of what put out of the market. Um, <clears throat> and um, this, is, uh, this is something you'll see probably early next year. This is the, uh, this is the Galaxy S8, or at least the rendering. And uh, <clears throat> this is also a product you might see next year. And uh, this, is a, this is one of the uh, you know, um, rumors, let's say, of the type of product that could use a complete OLED screen display. So to us, the belief was our technology was valuable. And we went and tested it with different customers. And we jumped from uh, the United States over to Korea, over to Asia, and were able to really uh, be flexible and pivot in terms of fundraising, which was able to keep our company alive and growing. And uh, to this day, we're still, you know, we're still growing. Thank you very much.